minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Lift off of Ares 1X. Testing concepts for the future of new rocket design. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. We all love rockets, or we wouldn't take the time and effort to make these lessons, and you wouldn't be here watching. I am a generalist in space science. This means that I strive to have a broad understanding of all areas of this discipline, from the medical to the metallurgical. But space science is a complicated subject, combining many different disciplines, none of which is completely known to any one person. There are specialists in every area of rocket science, that know much more about any given subject than I ever will. And each of these disciplines, from physics to electronics and thermodynamics to turbo pump design, are critical to the success of a space launch system. The failure of almost any component can cause disaster. The success of any space system design is owed not only to the engineers and technicians who built it, but also to those who went a different route and found a dead end for everyone else to avoid. But most especially, to those who did the basic research, who spent their livelihoods solving the most fundamental problems that make everything else easy in comparison. There has been no greater gift to humanity's struggle to transcend this world than the scientists and engineers at NASA. I know the German scientists jumped ahead during World War II, with alcohol field rockets, by the way. Talking about RP-1, I was thinking of the Soviets. And the Soviet scientists were brilliant. They made amazing progress in the space industry setting many of humanity's first milestones. But most of their knowledge was kept behind a wall of secrecy. In fact, the man who was probably their greatest spacecraft engineer, Sergei Pavlovich Korolev, did not receive a Nobel Prize for putting the first satellite into orbit. The Soviet government did not want to credit his success, partially because they didn't really trust him. He had refused to denounce a colleague during one of Stalin's purges and spent years in the Soviet gulag for that transgression. Korolev oversaw the start of human spaceflight, but died before he could perfect a rocket to the moon. The moon mission was taken over by Valentin Petrovich Glushko. Glushko was born in what is now Ukraine, and was about the same age as Korolev. Glushko was 14 when he started reading the novels of Jules Verne, and wrote a letter to Konstantin Tsiolkovsky the self-taught first true master of rocket science. Glushko trained as a sheet metal worker in the port of Odessa, and later became a hydraulics apprentice and a lathe operator. This is a great start to being a good engineer. Modern rocket companies sometimes make the mistake of placing degrees over hands-on experience. In Odessa, during the Bolshevik Revolution, he learned to take apart artillery shells so he could experiment with the explosives. When he was 16, he wrote articles about exploring the moon for the local paper and discussed the engines imagined by Tsiolkovsky. He started studying physics and mathematics at Leningrad State University, but became impatient to get started and quit without graduating. He was hired by the Gas Dynamics Laboratory to study liquid propellant and electric rocket engines. But when the Bolsheviks won the revolution, he was rounded up and thrown in prison. While in prison, the new Soviet regime put him to work building aircraft. In 1941, he was put in charge of rocket development for the Soviets and finally released in 1944. Korolev and Glushko worked together on the RD-1 rocket engine, used to boost aircraft to higher speeds and altitudes, as the Soviet Union fought to defend itself from Hitler's advanced aircraft. When the war ended, Glushko was sent to what became East Germany to study what the Germans had accomplished. He became a colonel and was put in charge of Operation Backfire which tried to learn as much as possible about the V-2 rocket design. In 1946, he applied this knowledge to OKB-456 as the chief designer, where he stayed until 1974. He helped design the RD-101 engine, used in the Soviet R-2 rocket, which was based on the V-2 design. He then went on to design original engines like the 103, 107, 108, and 110, all flown in early rocket systems by the Soviets. He then designed one of the most powerful rocket engines ever built, the RD-170. The RD-170 has been described in many of our lessons, 
It is an RP-1 fueled engine with four combustion chambers, and one turbo pump powered by an oxygen-rich preburner. We explained last lesson that oxygen preburners burn cleaner than fuel-rich ones. This matters a lot for RP-1 rocket engines, but less for hydrogen or methane ones. The problem with oxygen preburners is that hot oxygen is a problem for any metal. If we build a titanium preburner chamber, we can design it to withstand tremendous pressure. If we fill it and surround it with argon gas, we could heat it up to about 1,668 Celsius before it would melt. But if we did the same in an oxygen gas environment, it would start to burn at only 610 Celsius. If we used the superalloy Inconel instead, our chamber could survive between 900 and 1,300 Celsius. It was the development of superalloys that let the Soviets make the powerful clean-burning turbopump that powered the RD-170. The Soviets were hoping to beat the Americans to the moon, but the powerful RD-170 came too late for the Soviet moon rocket. The Soviets had not taken the American challenge seriously and were four years behind Saturn V's development when they started on the N-1. The N-1 used a large number of the smaller NK-15 RP-1 engines, each producing about 1,500 kilonewtons. The RD-170 produced 7,900 kilonewtons, meaning the N-1 would have only needed six of them to fly. But Korolev died, the N-1 crashed, and the Soviet moon mission was canceled. The RD-170, cut from four chambers to two, is what we call an RD-180, and is still flying on several American rockets today. But the RD-170 was not the pinnacle of Glushko's genius. This was. This is the RD-270. It was designed and built in 1969. This was the world's first full-flow staged combustion engine. There are several different rocket engine cycles. The simplest would be a pressure-fed monopropellant where one liquid, like hydrogen peroxide or hydrazine, is ran over a catalyst, producing hot gas, which goes into a converging-diverging nozzle and produces thrust. Most reaction control systems use these. The next simplest would be a pressure-fed bipropellant system using hypergolic propellants, like the monomethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide Super Draco engines, used in the SpaceX Dragon capsule for launch abort. The ascent propulsion system on the Apollo lunar module was of this type. These are simple and dependable. Open the valves, the propellants mix, and they burn every time. Next, we have pumped rocket cycles. These start with a gas generator cycle. In these cycles, hot gas is produced in a small combustion chamber, sometimes called a preburner, like here. Though others limit the latter term only to staged combustion cycles. We'll get to what this means in a minute. The gas generator can be used to power one or two turbo pumps. Then the exhaust of the gas generator can be dumped overboard. This would be an open cycle gas generator rocket engine. The Merlin rocket engine is of this type, as was the Saturn V F1. If the exhaust is pumped back into the combustion chamber, it would be a closed cycle engine. A rather rare option is to run a pipe from the combustion chamber to power a turbo pump. This is a tap-off system, seen in the New Shepard BE-3 hydrogen-fueled rocket engine. There are other options with fuels like hydrogen and methane, and something called an expander cycle. Because these cryogenic liquids flash to high-pressure gas when heated, they can be used to power a turbo pump without combustion. This is called an expander cycle engine, like the RL-10 which uses expansion to power a turbine and gears to spin the hydrogen impeller and oxygen impeller at different speeds. This is a very efficient rocket engine, but it is difficult to scale up. As the combustion chamber increases exponentially, the ability to harvest heat only increases linearly. Another option is to run all of one propellant into a preburner, adding a little of the other propellant to power a turbine. This is a staged combustion engine. Because the propellants are partially burned in a preburner before being completely burned in the combustion chamber. This preburner can be either fuel rich or oxygen rich. In a fuel rich preburner stage combustion engine, all of the fuel goes through one or more preburners and is partially burned, with a little of the other propellant to power the turbo pump system and pump the propellants. Preburner can be fuel rich, burning a little oxygen with a lot of fuel, like the space shuttle main engines, which uses a hydrogen fuel rich preburner to power the high pressure fuel pump. Then another fuel-rich preburner to power the oxidizer pump. An expander cycle is used in this system to power these two low-pressure pumps. This is staged combustion, but it is not full-flow staged combustion. To understand why, let's start here. 
This is the low pressure hydrogen pump. The fuel comes in here first. The propellant tanks are somewhat pressurized, so the hydrogen will move through these pipes. It goes first through this pump, then will be stopped if this main valve is closed. It cannot go further until the main fuel valve opens. When this valve opens, the fuel can flow around the nozzle and combustion chamber, and up to this expander cycle pump, as well as to this pre-burner. Coming into this pre-burner will be a little bit of liquid oxygen. These will be ignited in the pre-burner, and the partially burned hydrogen fuel will spin this turbine, and then head into the combustion chamber. The turbine will spin the large high-pressure hydrogen pump down here, which will start rapidly putting more liquid hydrogen into this system. Over here, there will be another hydrogen-rich pre-burner. Partial combustion will produce hot hydrogen gas and some steam, which will run this turbine and then go into the main combustion chamber. This turbine will spin the high-pressure oxygen pump. Here is the main oxygen valve. When it opens, oxygen can go through into the main combustion chamber. A little bleed-off line here will use some of the pressurized liquid oxygen to power the low-pressure oxygen pump, just like on the other side for the hydrogen. Oxygen will hit the fuel in the combustion chamber, and after going through the pintle system, it will burn here and provide propulsion. This is a fuel-rich staged combustion system. One of the reasons to have both a low-pressure pump and a high-pressure pump is to prevent cavitation. Cavitation is when a fast-spinning propeller or impeller creates enough low pressure due to Bernoulli's principle to cause gas bubbles to form. These impede the pumping of liquid and can also damage the blades, acting like small explosions on impact with the metal. But this is not full flow stage combustion. We could call this partial flow fuel rich stage combustion, I guess. But what if we could run all the oxidizer through a pre-burner, partially burning it with a little fuel, and run all the fuel through another pre-burner, partially burning it with a little oxidizer? Then we would have turned the liquid propellants into hot gas, one fuel rich and the other oxidizer rich. These would mix and burn very efficiently, reducing residence time. This would be very easy to do with hypergolics. The RD270 had two pre-burners. All of the fuel went through one where a little oxidizer was added, and all of the oxidizer went through another where a little fuel was added. These pre-burners powered their own turbo pumps, which could be adjusted individually, allowing for different fuel oxidizer ratios to be quickly selected. Then the two hot gases would meet in the combustion chamber and immediately create the heat and pressure that powers the modern rocket engine. This was the world's first full flow stage combustion engine, designed and built by Glushko over half a century ago. But hypergolics are toxic and very tough on a reusable system, as well as very dangerous to work around. After the Medellin disaster, the Soviets preferred working with RP-1. The RD-270 was canceled in 1964. Glushko had wanted to use the RD-270 to build the UR-700 and UR-900 rocket systems. The UR-700 was designed by Vladimir Chelome, and with a payload capacity of 151 metric tons, would have been more powerful than the Saturn V. It could have powered an LK-1 Soviet lunar lander straight to the moon. Then the UR-900 rocket would have been built. This would use 15 of the RD-270 engines in the first and second of four stages to put 240 metric tons into low Earth orbit. And finally, the UR-700M would have had a nuclear thermal-powered central core and was designed to lift 750 metric tons to low Earth orbit. This would have been used to construct the 1,400 metric ton MK-700 spacecraft in orbit. The MK-700 would then have used an RD-410 nuclear engine to travel on to Mars. But the Soviet politicians focused their funding instead on the oxidizer-rich pre-burner closed cycle NK-33. Glushko dutifully went on to design the RD-170, which powered the four boosters of the Energia rocket system, able to lift 100 metric tons to low Earth orbit. This system launched the Soviet space shuttle Buran and the military space station Almaz. It could have gone on to take the Soviets to the moon, and there was an even more amazing fully reusable upgrade called the Uragan, or Hurricane. But by the end of the 1980s, the Soviet Union, having exhausted its resources on a senseless war in Afghanistan, was falling apart. 
The Energia only flew twice, and everything else was canceled. Glushko died in 1989. But having mastered the alloys necessary for oxidizer-rich preburner technology, the Soviets had enabled a more powerful and advanced system. In the 1990s, NASA headed a project that was run through the United States Air Force Research Laboratory. This project was called the Integrated Powerhead Demonstrator. Their goal was to make the world's first non-hypergolic full-flow stage combustion engine. The prime contractors were Aerojet and Rocketdyne, before they joined forces, as well as Pratt & Whitney. This team started building and testing parts of this system in hopes of producing an advanced reusable rocket engine. They made several innovations, using hydrostatic bearings in the turbo pumps instead of ball bearings. Hydrostatic bearings float on a high-pressure layer of liquid or gas, preventing them from actually contacting any moving parts, allowing a much longer-lasting system than traditional bearings. The development of this engine was supposed to be a three-phase project. The first phase was the powerhead itself, the powerhead or power pack of a rocket engine is everything except the main injector, main combustion chamber, and nozzle. For this demonstrator, they would produce a fuel-rich preburner. In this case, they chose hydrogen, powering the fuel turbo pump side, and an oxidizer-rich preburner using liquid oxygen to power the oxidizer-rich side. This was built and completed testing at the Stennis Center in Mississippi. It was operated at full capacity and finished over 20 tests but then further funding was canceled. They never added the combustion chamber and nozzle to complete the rocket system. So when SpaceX began researching a rapidly reusable rocket engine to fly their starships to the moon, Mars, and beyond, they had this NASA-funded research to guide them. Choosing methane over hydrogen increased the energy density and reduced the size of the propellant tanks. The Raptor engine is indeed the first full-flow stage combustion engine to fly. Not in space yet, but hopefully soon. FAA willing. And when it does, there will be decades of research from dedicated scientists and engineers from all over the world, some of them long dead, that made it all possible. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help support us on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. And please note that we will put links in the description to the fantastic artists that create the graphics that make these lessons more understandable. We appreciate you. At Astro Proterra.